we look for interesting and obscure topics for Roundtable Perspective. Today, Dr. Paul Hecht joins me to examine a character in Elizabethan literature. Her name is Rosalind. She appears in As You Like It, but also in a work by Spencer and by another author. Welcome to the Roundtable Perspective. I'm your host, Tom Roach, and I'm joined by my guest today, Dr. Paul Hecht. We're going to discuss a, uh, essentially a biography that Paul's writing about a fictional character. Um, and uh, let me talk to you a little bit about Paul first. Paul has a um, PhD from Cornell University. Uh, he studied English literature there. Uh, he teaches at Purdue University Northwest right now in the English department. And he um, recently published a book, Spencer in the Moment, with co-editor J.B. Lethbridge. Uh, and he's written several articles over his career about Shakespeare and Elizabethan England. Right now, Paul, what you're working on is uh, a character that you've found that appears in two or three different works during the Elizabethan era. And you think that it's not just the name that these characters have in common, but actually that, they've, that they're actually writing about the same personality, at least. I don't know. Yeah. Tell us about it. Well, yeah, so it's, this is an unconventional biography, um, and it's uh, covering the last 20 years of the 16th century. Okay. Uh, so it begins in 1579, and it ends in 1600. Um, and two of the phases of this are actually, I mean, the, the connection is, is known, um, in that um, Shakespeare wrote a comedy, As You Like It, uh, which uh, was uh, probably written right around 1600. Um, and that draws heavily on a popular uh, fictional uh, piece that had come out 10 years earlier by a writer named Thomas Lodge, who's not very well known. Uh, but the Thomas Lodge uh, book, um, and it's not a play, it's, it's, it's sort of fiction mixed with poetry, all, all set in a, uh, in a country setting. Um, that, that contains many of the characters in As You Like It, including the main character, Rosalind, uh, who is the, the star of As You Like It and who is the subject of this biography. So the thing that I've done that is a little bit pushy or original here is that yeah. I've extended this timeline back to 1579 when Rosalind, there is a Rosalind who appears and she, does, she never actually says anything. So she, she's a presence yeah. in a group of, connect, of 12 connected poems um, uh, about a shepherd named Colin Clout. This was the first uh, significant work by Edmund Spencer, the poet who would go on to write a huge uh, epic called The Fairy right. Queen. Yeah, he was not someone who suffered from writer's block. Uh, no, no, he, right. uh, he was an incredibly prolific poet, yeah. um, incredibly te technically masterful as well. He wrote only really, really hard poetry right. uh, and wrote really a lot of it. Yeah, uh, he, was, he was something to be avoided in graduate school, as I recall. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes. well, by some, yes, <laughs> yeah. uh, yes for sure, yeah. So, um, the, um, the, the character in, uh, in Shakespeare, now it's been known that Shakespeare used other oh, yeah. works to get characters and plots, obviously. Uh, and is this one that was identified a long time ago? Yeah. This yeah. relationship? It's been known for a long time. And really the, the only, it's interesting that when the text that I use for, uh, yeah. when, I'm, when I'm writing about The Lodge, it's all stuff that was published to support Shakespeare. Sure. Um, some of them are, are, actually there's one quite good one that's a school text. It was, uh, you know, it's clearly something to round out some kind of Elizabethan drama course that was being done, you know, 70 yeah. or 80 years ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, tell, us, tell us about Rosalind. What, what's, what, what makes up this character? So, I mean, Rosalind is, I mean, one of the things that I'm most interested in about her is that she is one of the most appealing uh, of Shakespeare's characters, period. And um, that's quite a list. And there's quite a list. Yeah. And and she's also uh, clearly one of the most uh, appealing female characters uh, that he wrote. And and it is, I believe, it is the longest female role that he wrote. Full stop. Um, so there's just more of her than most there is lines. of anyone else. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I remember uh, I heard uh, there was a panel discussion about Shakespeare and the law that I went to maybe 10 years ago at the University of Chicago and uh, the philosopher Martha Nussbaum was there and somebody asked the question of well what what character what Shakespeare character would you like most like to be yeah. and I remember that she she said Rosalind she didn't have to think about it at all yeah. um, uh, and uh, so she's um, incredibly smart uh, incredibly witty um, she uh, She's forced into exile uh, by uh, political circumstances uh, in the city in which she lives. We don't ever find out what that city is. 
And she dresses up as, uh, as a young man, as many of uh, Shakespeare's uh, right. female leads do, especially in the comedies, um, and uh, renames herself Ganymede. And then she has adventures in the woods uh, as, this, uh, as, this, as this man. And, and in fact, while she's dressed up as, as Ganymede, she at one point also dresses up as Rosalind. Um, so, so she's, she's impersonating a man, impersonating a woman. Well, and in fact, if you go all the way back to the, the, your knowledge that uh, in, in Elizabethan England, uh, female roles were generally played <laughs> by, by, by young, young boys. <laughs> she's just, just a boy who dresses up as a girl, who dresses up as a boy who dresses yeah. up as a girl. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it, it's, it's one of the most desirable roles, I understand, right, if you're, uh, if you're an actress and you're doing... Uh, uh, or an actor, I guess, in Elizabethan times. Yeah. Uh, well, no, I mean, it actually wasn't. I mean, it's... We don't know how, I mean, you know, we, we don't have a sense that it was particularly popular in Shakespeare's life, but yeah. um, when Shakespearean drama started to be performed in whole again in the 18th century, it became a star yeah. vehicle for, for actresses, and it's really remained so ever since. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, so I guess I, I should, if getting back to the, sure, the purpose yeah. of the book, yeah. I mean, so here we have one of the great products of Elizabethan literature. And so one of the things that I'm trying to do with the biography is, is do an exploration of how, how Elizabethan literature got to this point in, in this 20-year period. Because really, if you start in 1579, we really see, if you read the, the general stuff that was around right. in, in the late 1570s in England, it's very hard to imagine how we are going to get to Shakespeare from, right. from this point. Right. Uh, it's sort of like trying to figure out how the Beatles get from She Loves You to, uh, you know, Sergeant Pepper in three years, sure, right? Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. Only uh, much more complicated, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I'm, I'm trying to trace that journey as well as tracing the character. Yeah. So she's, in ways, she's an excuse to, to trace that yeah. uh, amazing period of development, you know, with a sort of specific focus on a character. But she's a very interesting character. I mean, I, I'm, I'm assuming that's why she's written about two or three times. Right? I mean, someone came up with a personality here that was worth repeating how, what what does uh, what does the Shakespeare character have in common with the uh, with the other characters I mean all of what you said or um, well I think the, the, the constant through yeah. through the three is uh, is criticism really um, uh, it's, a, it's a skeptical attitude toward um, uh, men and literature in fact mm -hmm. um, so uh, from the get-go she's she's uh, somebody who's casting a lot of um, uh, or, or projecting critical pressure on the entire enterprise of literature. Uh, really? So how does she do that? Well, um, we're introduced to her in the very first poem of the Shepherd's Calendar, um, Spencer's, Spencer's book in 1579, yeah. uh, when this poet who's a sort of stand-in for Spencer, his name's Colin Clout, um, is lamenting the fact that Rosalind uh, doesn't, doesn't care for him, and he, he comments specifically that uh, shepherd's device, which I take to be, you know, the songs that shepherds do, the whole sort of shepherd shtick. Yeah, you know, yeah. Shepherd's device, she hateth as the snake, um, is, is so the she, line. So he wrote poetry for her and she critiqued it, basically. And, and she just crushed it under her heel, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, I, I mean, I think what's really, what's really interesting about that is it, it captures, I mean, we look back on this period now as this, er, this time of literary glory, but yeah. I think the people who were living in it, even the people who went on to be the, the most major right. writers, right. it didn't look like that at all. It looked like England was really late coming to the, to the Renaissance, right. like every other country in Europe had already done uh, you know, great uh, you know, eternal yeah. works of fiction and poetry and theater and things like this, and how are we going to do it, you know, this, this backwoods, backwater place in England? Um, and so Rosalind sort of concentrates that, uh, uh, that fear and that skepticism, yeah. and she gives it a voice. And is she critical of, you know, um, the, you know, the more uh, homespun type poetry? Is she critical of everything? Because you know, I imagine this is sort of a pastoral yeah. um, thing she's critiquing, right? Yeah, I mean, she does, and it's not a deep critique. She would I mean, have liked Robert Frost, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> we don't, we don't, know, we never find out about that. We don't. Okay. Uh, but she does, and, you know, and it could, you could read this as just she just doesn't doesn't like literature. But yeah. um, she, what she attacks are the are the sorts yeah. of things that that Spencer is writing in, in yeah. this book. Yeah. Um, it's only later though that 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 this critical mindset gets developed. So in the next um, yes. book in Lodge then we start to see a much more fully developed critique of, let's say, all male erotic poetry. You know, uh, poetry that, uh, or any, any the, the way that men use literature to try to seduce women. 
that gets a, a, a really yeah. strong uh, critique. Um, also in that, in so that, she doesn't like carpe diems. Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. but she, you know, but she sees she sees men as using their literary talent for vicious ends, really. You know, in order yeah. to satisfy their appetites and lusts and things, and not for you know any higher purpose. Or like, and she yeah. just takes them down. That'd be a, a good topic for a song, I think. I think we should, somebody should be listening to this and uh, work with it. Um, so is she, um, you know, does she have anything in common with the other characters? You know, because as you're mentioning her being critical of, of things, I'm thinking of uh, Catherine in, uh, uh, in Taming of the Shrew, perhaps, or, um, you know, it, it, how does she compare to other, I'm just trying to get a picture of her, get a feel for her personality yeah. a little bit. Uh, I, I think, um she, there's a, there's one of the things that's, that's most appealing about the, the Shakespearean version especially yeah. is um, uh, the sort of lightness with which she yeah. approaches everything. So um, she can be uh, incredibly cutting, but, but then just flit on to the next thing. Um, she, uh, so I think, and that's, that's in contrast, I think, to some, some of the other characters, to Catherine maybe, and some, yeah. some other um, yeah. uh, characters. I, it's one of the things that's uh, she's she manages to be both sincere and earnest and convincing and also uh, just have this incredible sort of uh, lightness or flexibility yeah. um, and just spewing out these insights into yeah, things, you know, yeah. It's, it's very appealing I mean we, we all yeah. wish that we could just just yeah be, be as as intense as she can be in certain moments and yet not have it weigh us down in any way and just right. move on to the next thing right okay now I'm thinking Uma Thurman maybe and, uh, <laughs> Um, a Tarantino movie, but um, so, uh, but Shakespeare actually does engage in criticism from time to time in his plays, right? I mean, he, is it in Hamlet where he, he tells the, he's got Hamlet telling the actors not to saw the air and with their hands and, uh, and things like that. Is that, is that actually, a common theme or? Yeah, I mean, uh, meta theatricality. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, now we're talking Theatrical rather than sort well, of literary yeah, uh, right, right. self-criticism, but yeah, yeah, it's all over the place in Shakespeare. It's definitely a, it's a theme. It's a, you know, um, something like the the play within the play in Midsummer Night's Dream, which then gets mocked by the, the people who are watching it. Um, right. He loves setting up moments like that, um, and I think I think those are actually. I, I'm not the first one to have written about this, but yeah. messing with illusion like that is clearly a way of accessing certain kinds of power, um, mm -hmm. of theatrical power, um, right. uh, at least. I'm, I'm convinced of that um, because. You but know, that's kind of a subject of the Tempest too, isn't it? Sure. Yeah. In sure. A, in a more abstract sense. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. The theatrical illusion is being being accessed as a, as a, it's a form kind of, of magic. magic. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, that's really good. So. Um, does does she come up again? You know, in contemporary. I know you also write about uh, pop culture a little bit. You know, does she, does she come? I've been comparing her with people. I'm thinking of you know, uh, joking about movies and things that I've seen. But seriously, is there anyone later than that that, that not with the name basically, but that kind of reflects that kind of attitude? I so I I have I've done one piece um, on Lady Mary Roth, who is a really important uh, writer, mm -hmm. uh, one of the most important um, early. English female writers that, who ever lived. She did the, yeah. the first, um, uh, she did, she did uh, a sequence of poems and uh, a drama and uh, an enormous uh, uh, prose romance. Anyway, I've, I've written about how, um, I've sort of theorized how Rosalind might have provided a kind of uh, pattern for her to take advantage of as the first female writer of, uh, well, actually one of the first female writers of um, love poems in English, but that's pretty close to that's pretty close to the original. I mean, that's just in yeah. the early 17th century. Later, um, I, I I haven't found any anything that's a, a direct outgrowth. I've been really. I mean, she, there's a really interesting theatrical history. Um, I, uh, I I came across um, uh, a wonderful dissertation about um, that was that was tracing um, uh, as you like it performances. And that led me to uh, the actress Dora Jordan, who's one of the, uh, the great uh, later English actresses, full stop. But she was particularly well known for her, yeah. um, her Rosalind performances. Um, and the way, that, the way people talk about them is fascinating to me, like what, what it was about her that made people just go crazy for this, uh, this particular Rosalind performance. They would, they would talk about her, her figure and uh, uh, and there are sort of things that are very hard to understand what, what exactly is being referenced. 
Yeah. Um, there's a, yeah, so, I, but, but no, there's nothing direct. Yeah, that well, um, well, so let's, uh, let's provide some background here. So Elizabethan drama, this, the, the, uh, the Renaissance starts in Italy. It takes a few years to get to England. What, what is this, what, what's happening in England uh, that, bring, that brings about the Renaissance? What, what's a starting date for us? Well, I mean, right around 1579 is, is, a, is a decent one. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, the political and religious history in England is uh, very important to, to the way the Renaissance plays out there. But I don't actually know of any, of any particular explanation other than in, you know, the distance, you know, sort of looking at the thing on the map, yeah. it all sort of makes sense that it, this thing starts in Italy and then it makes its right. way gradually right. northward and it takes you know, 100 years or more before similar kinds of intellectual, um, uh, you know, similar kind of intellectual movement has arrived um, in England. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, and, and what else is going on? I mean, what, what are some other characters that, uh, you know, that are, that we, just, we just say stand out? I mean, obviously Shakespeare's um, Juliet and, um, and, you know, who are, who are the, you know, you said she, at one point you, we were talking, you said that she was sort of the, uh, you know, the most desirable uh, female part to play, right? I mean, right. what are the other ones? Well, uh, Just I mean, the big roles yeah. from the tragedies, yeah. uh, I think, attract uh, a lot of, uh, of, of actors for, yeah. for very good reasons. I, um, I think, uh, you know, Lady Macbeth. Oh, of course, yes. <laughs> it's a pretty fabulous yeah, role. Yeah, that was I mean, and, and through history, there's, yeah. you know, there, there are people who have been, sp uh, usually people haven't been able to specialize in both the tragic roles and the, and the comic roles. Oh, that's but occasionally there were actresses who could do both with equal, yeah. um, uh, equal effectiveness, um, Desdemona, uh, sure. you know the, the Gertrude, um, the, the, you know the, the roles from the major tragedies are all yeah. are all huge. Um, yeah, it's. I never thought although, of Gertrude as being that complex. Oh, I, yeah. I mean, so I just directed Hamlet last year. Yeah. Of course, um, she's married to the man who killed her husband. So. Well, and also I feel I've I've always I, I have a sense that she's the most. Um, she, I, I, people, people may uh, disagree with me about this, yeah. but she, to me, she seems the most uh, intelligent character in Hamlet after Hamlet. Oh, really? Um, the one who's able to follow him the most, um, yeah. who never gets lost as he, uh, as his mind uh, goes through right. all of the places it goes through. So, I mean, I can say, uh, as a, just an interesting addendum, this is something that I came across last year and then and then took advantage of in my. Uh, in the production that we put on here, PNW production of Hamlet, and that is the extraordinary tradition of um, female actors who have played Hamlet. So there's quite a tradition of this. Um, major uh, productions in huge theaters uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries, um, and you know tours where people would be thrilled with the prospect of this actress coming to play to yeah. play Hamlet. Um, so actually, the connection between Rosalind and Hamlet is a sort of an interesting one to, to think about. For, really? For well, yeah. I mean, there's a there's a way in which the you know her satiric um, uh, mindset and um, her um, cutting insight uh, yeah. into all things around her really does feel reminiscent of of Hamlet. Um, or what we what we prize Hamlet for? What are sure. the things that's so appealing to us? He questions Hamlet. everything. Mm -hmm. Every everything he does, he questions. Right. Yeah. So, um, but but he seems to question things, kind of, in a melancholy way almost. Whereas it sounds like she's being uh, almost entertaining with her. Hamlet can be pretty comments. darn funny. I mean, he can. You know, yeah. There's, yeah. I, there's a there's lot. a yuck yuck Hamlet. Well, I mean, even that speech that you were referring to yeah. about you know uh, instructing the actors on how not to screw up and things. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty funny, actually. You know, just well, getting, it is. Getting, yeah, getting it that is. out in yeah. front of things. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think I think there's a there's an outsider connection to them as well. Um, yeah. And this is this is maybe one of the things. So one of the things that I've gotten. I mean, I started as, as somebody who was interested in the the technique of poetry. Um, it, the, the original for this study that I'm working on was really like how did how did poetry's you know the technical 
execution of Elizabethan verse, how did that develop in these last 20 years? But then I, I was dissatisfied with just sticking with the, the technical details of how, you know, what sort of rhythms were being accessed and how this was or wasn't like uh, Roman poetry and what it shared, you know, that sort of thing, which is sure. interesting, but uh, it wasn't interesting enough. Um, and so I wanted to, to link that with some other kind of development that was going on. And so that's taken me into feminist and uh, women's and gender studies and its whole approach to uh, Shakespeare and to Elizabethan literature. Um, and so one of the things that you can say about Rosalind is that, I mean, her, her, the fact that she's a woman seems like it's connected I mean, it's an obvious thing to say at some level, but it's, you know, the, the ability to stand outside and to question everything. Right. I mean, it helps that you're, you're from the gender that is the excluded That's gender. That's excluded that in is, the first place. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Um, and, you know, uh, the other uh, thing I, I considered, the, the Renaissance was, was sort of about coming to a kind of perfection, right? We were, there, there was a sense that um, through humanism, right, that we were perfecting our lives in certain ways. Do you, do you think you know, one of the, um, the motives, one of the points of the humor is to say, we're not there yet. This, you, know, you think this is really good, but it's not. We can, you know, we can go further. I, well, with respect to Shakespeare, I feel like I've yeah. only gotten a deeper and deeper sense of just how skeptical he is uh, uh, of the entire human enterprise. I mean, the more, right. the older I've gotten, the more I feel like I've connected to this level at which So he, Shakespeare didn't think we were attaining any kind of perfection mm, here. It, se it seems pretty, pretty harsh. Yeah, I think I agree with I mean, things do that. change in those late plays. There's a, there's a, you know, they have a, you know, when we, in some ways they're, they're like the tragedies redone except with a different outcome. Yeah. And so there does seem to be a different kind of uh, um, sensibility of merging there. But yeah, certainly in the period yeah. where I'm at, which, you know, so 1600 is right before he writes Hamlet and it's right before he stops writing comedies and, and doesn't write yeah. any more happy endings for a, a series of years. You know, we have all the great tragedies um, and then we get into that, that late period. But um, yeah, I mean, I, and you know, these comedies famously get more and more satirical, more and more corrosive. Um, and As You Like It is well along in that continuum which en ends with like measure, measure for Measure and Troilus and Cressida are the ones where it's like, is this even a comedy anymore? I mean, I think right. it's like too many bad well, things are happening. Yeah, and Troilus and Cressida is from uh, Chaucer, right? Is that my... Well, uh, yeah. yeah, and earlier, but yeah. yeah. And it's a very bitter, uh, sad story from... Yeah, it's incredible, yeah. Uh, though. I, that's one of the ones that I... When I first read that in graduate school, I couldn't believe this was the writer uh, that I had adored, you know, from high school yeah. through college because yeah. he, it seemed to take so many of the elements of, of his art and just make these uh, sort of awful jokes with them. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a one very dark view of, uh, yeah. well, certainly of the classical inheritance, right? I mean, yeah. It's an assault on all of these uh, historical figures from, from Troy as just being a bunch of um, cowards and, and, yeah. and losers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, um, you know, the, the, one of the things that interested me most about this is the idea that there are um, fictional characters that get picked up again and again and, and reused yeah. uh, throughout the history of literature. Um, the, I guess at, at one point the, uh, there were the morality plays, right? And, the, and there was a greed character in there. And I think I, 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 I read uh, uh, someone saying that the Richard III character was actually the, the greed character kind of mm. put into a play, mm -hmm, essentially mm -hmm. with, a, you know, with the king's crown. Mm -hmm. um, are, are there other... Um, Characters that you know they're fictional, but they show up again and again. Have you have you looked at it that way? Are there other biographers out there, fictional characters? You know, I mean, there are. Uh, there's there's a um, there's a biography of of Helen uh, of Troy. I mean, it's, e it's it's easy to do with mythological figures, right? Because right? they, I mean, those stories get told and right. retold and retold and retold. Right. Um, I don't know of anyone else who's done something that's focused in the way yeah. that, that I'm doing it, or, or for the same yeah. purposes that I'm doing it? Well, the Helen one is interesting because I think um, uh, students of rhetoric were asked to write defenses of Helen, and so there, I guess there were several of them out there. Uh, I believe Gorgias wrote one of the more famous ones. I don't know, maybe I'm quoting that wrong. Um, but, um, you know, and then of course today we've taken all of these uh, comic book characters and turned them into movie characters, and. Uh, adapted them in, in different ways, mm -hmm. uh, but still maintaining some sense of that original mm -hmm. identity. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is part of the, 
I mean, I think that had to be part of what it was like to see As You Like It for the first time if you were somebody who had consumed that earlier text and, and liked it, because it was very popular. So the audience was aware of the connection. Oh, then. yeah, yeah. I mean, some oh. of the audience, anyway, would have been. Yeah. And so, yeah, you would have had that same kind of sense of, I don't know, seeing the first Christopher Nolan Batman movie and sort of seeing everything reinvented in this right. deeper, more exciting yeah. way. Adam West. <laughs> yeah. I started with Adam West. Yeah, right. It's come a long way from Adam West, <laughs> yeah, right? I guess yeah. So, yeah, yeah. It's no longer a joke. Yeah. I, I feel like there is a sort of fan base of Rosalind, uh, you know, Rosalind lovers yeah. out there, yeah. and I really look forward to hearing from more of them, uh, as I expect this, this book ought to get some of their attention. All right, great. Yeah. That's all the time we have for our program. Thank you to Paul Hecht for joining me today on the Roundtable Perspective. I'm Tom Roach. See you next time.